This is Prabhu Rangarajan, co-founder of MTP Fintech. Take a minute, take a minute, take a minute. चलो ये कर लेते हैं In a gold rush, the ones who sell the shovels are the ones who make the most money. In the fintech gold rush that we are seeing today, it is a company like M2P Fintech that is selling the shovels, which also explains how they raised more than 100 million dollars in less than 2 years with their last valuation at 600 million dollars. M2P Fintech builds the pipes through which fintech startups can work with regulated financial institutions. They help banks to grow by integrating with a whole host of fintechs without incurring any apex and they help fintechs to focus on what they do best which is providing a great customer experience while m2p takes care of all the back end plumbing this episode is a must listen for anyone who wants to understand the whole fintech ecosystem in india and learn about how the various stakeholders in the space have worked together to create one of the most vibrant economies in the world and there's no one better than prabhu rangarajan founder of m2p fintech to hear this from Prabhu is a software developer turned entrepreneur and here he is telling Akshay about how it all started. 2014 was when like one year into cognizant I met Madhu and Muttu my other co-founders. I went to Madhu for a, a very different idea. I wanted to do an aggregator of aggregator. Ola was there, Uber was there, Fast Track was there. so many cab companies were there they all of them had apps by that time there was one company called taxi for sure all of them had uh, apps but when you wanted to book a cab you had to juggle between multiple apps so i told him why don't i create an app which is an app connect that connects to all the apps getting into anything that is direct to the customer it is not easy to build you have to do i mean have a lot of background around branding have a lot of thinking around customer support and all that but what really clicked was that when you do an app of apps there is this payment thing that you have to solve for which i went to madhu and told him my idea how can i solve the payment piece alone and then he liked the idea and he said forget about your larger vision just take this payment as a problem alone this itself is like a big enough problem worldwide why don't we just set out and solve that because i have already been in discussion with muttu i've been discussing with him over a cup of chai <laughs> so that's how it, it happened right like madhu and muttu were colleagues at visa so that's the m2 piece founding journey they were colleagues at visa they were placed in mumbai tamil guys being in mumbai you can understand they go to chai <laughs> or any break together so over a cup of chai they kept discussing that hey see these many banks are there these many companies are there but there is no one solution that is there which companies want to launch and bank can never banks can never come and bridge the gap so that's when the m2p idea was born this was mid 2014 and then i went to him and pitched so the trio met and agreed that we're going to build this yeah. what is this here just help me understand what was the idea so the idea was okay so what happened was that when uh, there were several companies like i'm talking about 2013 14 when paytm was in its infancy paytm was just a nap it was just a wallet huh? yes it was a wallet you can top up the wallet and use it for mobile payments and recharges and stuff the store payment also hadn't started back then right and paytm was probably a 20 million dollar company back then probably so that market was coming up it is it was just blooming and then there was this problem of companies wanting to launch several fintech products their products that embed finance into their core offering and then they want to launch it however what banks have was very conventional traditional banking models right and banks could not do program management they were unable to come out of their core which is current account savings account deposits and stuff and build a specific product for let's say a swiggy or a paytm right they were unable to do that so that was like a big white space which we understood that somebody had to come and do this program management piece or stitching all these things together and have a platform of sorts which can help fintech companies launch products faster this was the white space that we wanted to go and play with and we knew that yeah like, like what, what would be like a special product for a swiggy that a bank would need to develop give me like a more relatable sure. example like Sure. Say, for example, today you have, if you use Swiggy as a wallet, Swiggy as an app, there is a Swiggy Money section in that app, which is powered by ICICI Bank. 
Okay. Right. Swiggy cannot go and collect money from you and keep it themselves because in India everything is regulations. under uh, uh, regulations. RBI has clearly directed that either banks or prepaid instrument providers only, only these two entities can collect money from customers and retain it. And there has to be a ledger which maintains everything. So for Swiggy, having a friction-free app experience is very important. That's what they are. That's what defines them. And then for the wallet, you can't go and ask the regular set of questions that ICC Bank iMobile asks. Right? For you to open an account with ICC Bank, it, it is like you fill tons of forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably go and do a huge yeah. process. Yes. So for Swiggy, that won't cut ice, right? You will have to simplify that. And ICC Bank cannot go and do it all by themselves. They need an external help. They need a layer which simplifies this. M2P is that layer which can do that. At that time, were you able to conceptualize that there are all of these use cases which can be enabled if there is a layer in between? Like, I mean, today, of course, there is so much, yes. like there are all these neo banks, and so we can see, okay, that uh, neo banks are like working with existing infra and improving the consumer experience. But at that time, what did you conceptualize as a use case for this? So to be very honest, we did not coin the term payments infrastructure at that time. We wanted to attend to that white space where we knew that we had to build a platform which caters to the companies that want to launch products. The, the, we were only focusing on the fintechs, the aspiring fintechs. And uh, on the other side, if we were to do anything with money, we had to partner with the bank. So this was running in our mind. We never had this thought process to call it as payments infrastructure. Nobody in the world called it as payments infrastructure. At that point of time, if you had said payments infrastructure, people would have, would have probably thought AT machine or POS machine. which you Or even Visa story, and right? MasterCard are like, in a way, That's payment right. infrastructure That's companies. Right. Hmm. 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 That's right. So people would have probably discounted you for being one among those regular, what do you call it? companies. We honestly wanted to start something which can make go to market faster in the payments world. That's what and, we set out. And by payments here, you are talking of wallets as the use case because payment gateway is already there, right? If you just talk of right. helping a company collect payments, they have payment gateways already at that time. They were also there, although they were not so big. But so w right. what was it that you thought as a use case? So we, we initially thought we'll solve two major use cases. One was this wallet as an operating system never existed. Everybody had their own closed, I would say, walled garden. Paytm had their own walled garden. Free charge had their own. There was Oxygen. There was Mobiquick. All these companies had their own. And you can never do interoperability. That was very evident. So what we thought of was, why don't we build a wallet? We can white label it. Whoever wants to launch a wallet, they can just simply use our API stack and launch it themselves go right to RBI, partner with the bank, and then go right to RBI and say, this is our co-branded wallet and stuff like that, right? That was one. The second use case on that is, why don't we add a card, like a Visa or MasterCard on top of the wallet so that it becomes interoperable? These were the two use cases we set out to do in the first year of our existence. So what we did was we started building our wallet operating system. We tried to use somebody else's stack for that card issuing layer, the, the the card layer, the stack that can actually come and dip into the wallet, use the wallet balance for paying to any merchant that's out there. We did not want to, we were very clear that we will not be able to rewire the entire or re-engineer the entire uh, process around how payments are collected and done. We, we were very clear. We did not want to reinvent the wheel. We were very clear that these are the two things that we will be able to do because we were a team of five or six people at that time, back in 2014 or 15. So these were the two use cases that we took. We launched our first product, which is like a wallet plus card product for India Infoline. India Infoline had a gold loan portfolio. This was May of 2015 when we uh, launched a, a DCB Bank co-branded card with India Infoline gold loan as the brand. Right? So you, you go, the, the use case was that go to India Infoline outlet, pledge gold. They offer you cash or check into your account or NAFT transfer into your account or you can take a prepaid card and off you go. Turns out most customers who go and pledge gold make sure that their family doesn't know about it. Yeah. So this prepaid, <laughs> card was, this prepaid card was useful for them because they can keep it completely off the record when it comes to their bank statements and all. So it clicked. 
then we found out like this is a good use case we can go and reach out to many nbcs that are there like india and friend there was muttu manapuram so many other gold loan companies so many other lending companies which were trying to lend and disburse the money we thought the prepaid card would be an easy manner or easy handle to go and disburse the money that was the use case for the first year Right. Okay, just, just help just... me understand uh, how how this prepaid card worked exactly. So, uh, did the customer have to do the regular KYC and open an account at uh, DCB? Yes. So back then, the KYC guidelines for prepaid was a bit easier than opening an account because prepaid was seen as the cheaper alternative to opening an account at that time. That was a time like I'm talking about 2015, early 2015, when this Jandan account and all these things were pushed. cross so banks were already under stress to open so many different accounts like current account savings accounts and stuff so prepaid was an easier alternative then so the kyc was there was a concept called business correspondent so ifl had to sign up like a correspondent for the bank dcb and then, okay yeah and then of course there was a workflow which we built in a, in a web portal kind of model we gave it to the bank all the documents that were uploaded will be deposited in the bank's kyc system and they'll have an approve or reject button to see the kyc documents and approve it and then once the card is enabled it's all over a bunch of apis we knew that so this was a key decision right we did not want to build portals and front ends for everything we never had that skill set first of all we were not good at ui ux we were not good at branding so we knew for sure that this is not a strength why don't we have companies use their own front ends let's just stick to apis like the back end engine they be invisible in this entire journey and make sure that the the job gets done that's that was what we were after so we were very clear that we'll be like a core piece behind the uh, you know scenes not the one which is front ending the entire show yeah, okay and h- how did you crack these deals with the uh, first dcb to get them to partner with like a unknown unheard of company and with yeah. india infoline again that uh, this is a space where white hair probably helps to open doors and also how did three youngsters manage to crack these deals absolutely so uh, i think madhu and muttu's time at visa helped because they had met with almost all key decision makers in banks they had built a lot of goodwill they built a kind of sense that these guys understand the product well and w- the approach that we took was that when you go to a bank and ask them for money or ask them for a business opportunity and stuff like that unless you show that this is going to make revenue it's going to be very hard for the bank person to take a decision so when so when we went to the bank we had already convinced them that there is the strong use case and we will also bring a client for it and india infline had already agreed that okay if you are able to bring a bank we are ready to partner and try it out they said we'll initially try it out in a proof of concept model with five branches and then we can expand to all our 100 odd branches across india so that was the model that we went with so yeah, first how does the bank card in that yeah so every card that's issued the bank has an issuance fee attached to it there is a cost that indian friend in fact they charge the customer for it and the fee is paid to the bank and every transaction that's done through card, the bank runs fdr so yeah right the merchant MDR. discount rate okay so hmm. through the mdr the bank gets something called as interchange reimbursement so the bank earns every time and if they go and withdraw money cash using atms they again charge atm fee for that so the bank kind of never is in a position of losing money at any point of time and we gave the comfort that we will do it in a very small manner through that this works and then we'll expand it so we never went and asked them for a multi million dollar deal or anything like that we said we'll do 5000 cards at the, in the first batch make it right i know all rough edges and then we'll expand so that was the model and the bank was willing to so dcb bank was one of the banks which were not trying to go into the retail model where they were you don't see ads of dcb bank for regular yeah, yeah they they don't they have, have a retail presence right. yeah hmm. right they're a b2b bank they were very hmm. clear of their what they can do and what they can't it worked and uh, india and flyn and dcb were able to strike a proper conversation and get into a partnership kind of model and we became the technology service provider there did the branches have like cards over there and then they would just map the card and activate it and put the money in it the way it happens yes. in telecom like the sims are already there they just map it and activate exactly. it exactly exactly in fact okay. yes we mm. took inspiration of that insta sim right we call it as an insta card or insta kit 
So what we do is like all the terms and conditions, all the material of the bank that has to go, like the regulatory ask is there, right? Like you have to tell the customer explicit take an explicit consent from the customer on what they are getting into, the agreement, the you know, wet signature. All these things were packaged into one envelope. There was a card, there was a pin. All these things were there in that envelope and it was there as an instrument. So what India Influence brands effectively had to do was they promised this five-minute loan dispersal. That was a product that they launched back then. And we were able to help them get there because in five minutes, you can't do a Mac bank transfer at that point of time. Today, you can do it with Google Pay and all these things, you can do it. But at that point of time, it was very hard. So this kind of helped them to meet that strategy. You do the adjudication process in three minutes. If you're done, just pick a kit, enter the number and say transfer and it, it is done. So yes, we took that approach of stocking instant kits in the branches of India and Flying to begin with a few branches in Mumbai and mm-hmm. then we expanded uh, uh, you said that uh, DCB Bank had uh, like an approve reject button when they received the KYC document. So they needed to do that approve reject uh, real time. Right. right. See, one comfort for the bank over here is that the entity that is actually lending money will be more interested in the KYC, right? Generally. So Indian Influence as an entity, right? If they are seeing Akshay as a customer and trying to give money uh, in return for a gold that Akshay has, so there is already a collateral. The money is safe. Whatever they have lent is already safe. And the money that they are give, going to give you, the kind of documents that you give, they'll ensure that they vet it properly. And then the card is only an instrument using which they are giving that money out. So the bank is having a comfort that, number one, these guys have done due diligence on the customer and then made sure that this customer is the real guy, like the identity is verified and all these things. So there is thing, this thing called OSV, original, seen and verified, right? That every banker does. Like you would have seen that whenever you open a current account or savings account, somebody from the brand sees your original ID proof and gives it back to you. Right? So that process was done by these guys. So the bank had some amount of comfort and there is another additional comfort that India and is a regulated entity themselves. They are an NBFC, non-banking financial corporation. Right. So these are factors that added to it. So that's why when we went with the first set of products, we did not go with companies that were pure startups because we being a startup, the bank had to have some amount of comfort to go and launch it. So we went with established base. Okay, Got it. Okay. So you built this like the pipes to make this happen uh, yes. in. So which year was this? When did the India Infoline product go live? So this was 2015. Early 20, May 2015 was the first card issued for India Infoline in a branch in Mumbai. And and soon they also had some amount of technical issues that they had to solve. So it took a couple of months of testing back and forth. And then by August, September, we really scaled up. And then we did a cookie cutter model and tried to launch the same product or similar product across multiple lending companies like NBFCs. Hmm. They were several. Loan uh, focused or like any? Not just gold loan, like any, even there were NBFCs, which were, they, there is this concept called microfinance institutions, right? They give a group loan, a group of 10 women self-help group customers come and give a group collateral and take loans. These were target segments that we, we were able to tap into because the loan lending size was sub 10,000 rupees or 8,000 rupees. And the ticket size did not warrant a bank or the NBFC to push the customer to open a bank account. It did not really qualify. So it's a very small ticket size. So the prepaid card really fit into that purpose well. So whole of that year till early 2016, we were doing that. One question here. Uh, how were you funding this? Was it self-funded or did you raise? Or what? We were completely bootstrapped. We did not raise any funding. By mid of 2016, we knew that we can expand this. We can hire more people and have this into a proper vertical and then start focusing on bigger things. Then we were using the card stack was like a rented out card stack, which we wanted to, we we understood that it had its own limitations and all. So we wanted, we were always wary of the amount of scale it can take and all that. What what does that mean? You said the card stack was a rented out card stack. What does that mean? Yeah, the visa card stack. Uh, sure. So what happens is that if you want a card to be issued, there are three or four different entities that are required here. First is the network. Which network you're going to issue a card? That is Visa, Mastercard, Rupee. All of us know that. Second is the issuing bank is the DCB bank or ICC bank here, right? The bank which actually authorizes us to issue that card. Third is the technology, the switch and host of the card, 
which can actually generate that card number send that card details to a printer like manipal card technologies or color glass or some printer who can actually print that card into real plastic emboss that card you would have seen the card number will be embossed slightly raised embossed and silver tipped or gold tipped so that job is done by a card personalization vendor right so there are three or four different entities that are required to take a ship a card out so in all these things the card technology had to be certified by visa mastercard and rupee right you can't get it certified in a month or two it is generally a 6 to 8 month process where you build the software you attend to their uh, there is grammar involved in it how you interpret a transaction how you start a card number like a, like generate a sequence of card numbers there are a lot of logic behind it which we couldn't do we couldn't afford to do with being a bootstrap company right from day zero we we were unable to do so we had to partner with some company which where uh, which was able to lend it in a rented model to us so we just took a fork out of it and used it for launching the card product so you were actually responsible for getting the card printed and delivered to the nbfc okay right. which is why you needed card technology okay right okay right. okay got it so, got it hmm. and so uh, we were trying to make question. the experience so, sure. in these uh, nbfc deals uh, what was in it for you what was your way to earn so we had so we were on the bank side because to the nbfc we can't confuse them saying you'll have to pay me this and pay the bank that and all that so we kept it very simple out of whatever revenue that is generated the nbfc takes a cut and the bank takes a cut and with the bank we had a back to back arrangement where we had a cut out of the revenue that they make okay. so our like our lifetime revenue, lifetime yeah, revenue awesome. from that card Absolutely. like every yes. time the card is swiped there is some pennies on the dollar right. and right. you get some percentage of that okay that's true that's true that was how it the, the flow worked yeah okay the nbfc did not make any revenue from this this was just a way for them to give their customers a better experience they did make they did ha- have some amount of uh, incentive to use this card right so what was have, their kind incentive of, i would say like in a, i would say in let's say in a 100 rupee kind of ticket size let's say 20 to 30 rupees will be held by the bank the remaining 60 or 70 rupees or 80 rupees will be shared between the nbfc and us so the nbfc would at least require about 50 rupees as a you know cut for them to incentivize and use this card even they have to push their branches and branch personnel to use this card they have to do training all these things were there so they have they were also invested in technology and all that so we had to in- incentivize them so it was like more of 50 30 20 or probably like the ratio differed based on the size initially we did not have that negotiating power to go and ask for more and then over a period of time as we added more value to the entire chain we were able to extract more dollars so the nbfc would also get a share from the lifetime usage of the card like every time the card was swiped some part would be going to the nbfc also and That's then true. that one time initial the issuance fees that is charged to the customer that again gets split between all three parties that's right that's right okay 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 got it yeah so we were talking about how you were funding it and how you were bootstrapping it yeah what we had to do was that we were very particular that every card that is that is shipped out of the company is going to start earning revenue within 2 months because it it will not be sitting in the shelf uh, for a very long period we will we will stock it in such a manner that it doesn't waste time sitting in the shelf because cards also have this validity period problem when you generate a card number it has, so, so correct so we tell the nbfc or the actual customer that order w- only what is required for the next 2 months because the card order process is like a 3 to 4 week long process so just order for the next 2 months and then you can keep replenishing the stock so that's so we were very clear that a dollar spent today is going to come back with profits 2 or 3 months down the line so we were whatever money we had pumped into the company it was enough for us to run the operations all of us found us uh, the three of us never took any salaries we were very clear that at least we'll have to take the company to a respectable revenue and then start thinking about taking any money out of it in terms of salary or expenses so for the whole of first year we never took any money out we were pumping in money whatever we were able to pump in and uh, by you had to uh, uh, pump in for the card printing also what were you pumping yes. in yes yes so initially uh, yeah so for the card printing and for the the stack that we took as a rented model we had to pump in some money to keep the lights on basically and then for the card printing we were able to get some amount of credit period and all and we managed it 
and the NBFC was also willing to give 20-30% in advance also. So that kind of helped. So we were able to, so it was like very, it was a very closely, uh, I would say like we were on a very thin line in terms of crashing <laughs> and you know, surviving, right? Uh, we were able to pass that phase by efficiently managing the cash flow. And that's why we never took, you know, like the three of us never took salaries because had we taken, it would have been very hard, right? We were all in a high paying job. So it was not okay to kind of do that to the company in its first year at least. So by early 2016, having seen the progress and stuff, all the friends of Madhu, Mutu and mine had shown interest that, hey, why don't you actually, you don't need to raise, uh, you know, venture funding and all, even though we had VC fed, uh, friends and all that, uh, friends who were angel investors themselves. We had this idea that we can raise a small portion, dilute some equity and raise a friends and family round and all that because people are willing to, because for my, our friends, it was more like their dream coming through us. All of them wanted a startup, but they, every one of them were stuck in some commitment or the other. It was like more like a chakra, right? <laughs> Everybody were stuck in that loop. So they were willing to not much of money, like 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs at best per individual. And we raised about, uh, I think, some 60 or 70 lakhs in terms of capital and, through our yeah. friends and family. Yeah. And how many cards had you issued by that time? What was the total gross so, number of cards issued yeah we had done about at least close to a lakh of cards we had done by then and we had decent enough yes we had decent enough money in the bank to run operations in a loop so we did not have this cash flow kind of issue and all of course we took few calls we wanted to make sure come what may rain or shine we have to pay salaries on the last working day of every month we have to pay number two like any vendor or any supplier that we use we will ensure that we meet the payment terms that they had. So these were thumb rules that we took when we agreed upon, when we shook hands. So we said, only after all these things are met, we will take our salaries or any money out. So this was a first principle that we agreed upon. So we wanted to make sure that when even at a time when we grow or when we pivot and try to rebuild that entire thing ourselves and all that, we had to have some money in the bank so that we can pay the salaries for the next one year or so. So we wanted to keep that six to eight months of salaries in the bank to be comfortable and make sure that our people don't suffer. So that was the reason why we first of all went and agreed to do a friends and family round. We initially wanted to do only about 50 lakhs and then several very interested friends had to push us to push it slightly upward. It was around 100k at that time dollar was around 70 so we did a 100k round and closed it and what did you use these funds for the card technology card yeah so this was and... so, yeah so what we wanted to do was we wanted to hire a few folks we were who were slightly on the on the expensive side we had to afford their salaries number one number two we wanted to build like what we were wary of at that time was that the rented technology that we took started showing its age and its colors true colors we were not able to scale it as and when we like it was not flexible enough so we were very clear that we had to build if at all so that was when this payments infrastructure piece started you know striking us okay what we are doing is program management at best we are trying to take whatever is already there in the market put it together in a meaningful manner in a timely fashion make sure that we take care of the heavy lifting and the banks are always used for any regulatory stuff so this was more like an a la carte of products which you are putting it together in a right manner and taking it out. There was nothing innovative about it. Yeah, Only the manner in which like we were assembling, doing. basically. Right, effectively. So at that point of time, it struck us that there is no infrastructure. The, the the overall thing that we do can be built over a bunch of APIs, or we can actually have a proper layer which does this over and over again. And this was a worldwide problem. So over, worldwide, if you see, Marketa was one company which was which had attained a meaningful scale at that time in the US. There was no other equivalent of any such company existing in the world. I'm talking about, again, 2015 or uh, late 2015. If you see, other than Marketa, there was no other company which was doing the, uh, a similar business as ours. So we thought... And okay, Marketa is spelled as what? M-A-R-K-E-T-A? Q-E-T-A. It's okay. a public company now. Okay. Marketer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So they were building like an API first kind of an approach to... Yeah, connect. they called their offering as modern card issuing stack. And then we coined this term called payments infrastructure. So we, we, we also believed like initially our brand name was called as YAP, Y-A-P. 
it was pay in reverse we thought that the card product overall itself was in its last stages of kind of evolution it's probably going to go and we, everything will become invisible and it, everything will become push based payment like i'll explain what is push based payment so the entire card technology piece or the card based payments piece is called as pull payments why it's called as pull is because akshay going to a shop the shopkeeper asks your card or you dip the card in this terminal and that terminal actually pulls the money that is there in your account or credit limit to his uh, terminal right basically so that's pull payment whereas when you do a google pay or phone pay based payment like a qr payment it is push based right where you as a customer do not touch any of the merchants infrastructure at all you just scan their qr or enter their credentials like a vpa and then put your own passcode in your own phone or fingerprint or face id and then push that money to the merchant so we thought push payments is going to be the future it won't be pull and that's why we wanted to reverse the trend so that's why we said pay in reverse app and we went with a brand name called yap for the platform but then we figured out like in 2019 when we set foot overseas we saw that yap as a company name was there already in the middle east so we thought okay we'll have to just stick to m2p as a brand name yeah so what happened was in 2016 when we said this is payment infrastructure the reason for that was we had invested heavily and done r&d and try to make it a push based kind of model uh, we built on the m visa and the qr based payment model we were quite ready so that was then november 2016 number 8 2016 demonetization happened and there was a heavy push for digital payments right uh, paytm was really paytm took off back then like they had uh, like respect huge respect to whatever they had done they had entered into every store there was a paytm qr there people were able to scan and pay and all that but there was no standard single standard paytm had their own standard mobiquick had their own standard so what we did was we thought there is a huge opportunity to standardize this can we make all the qr talk one language and then luckily government came up with their own you know initiative called bharat qr bharat qr is the single for all payments in india all qr payments in india everybody had to follow that standard it was like a more like a tag length value kind of format right like where uh, you are amex this is it you are upi this is that this is your tag and all that so it was quite useful and we were ready in a jiffy because we had already thought this is going to be the future and we had already built a stack for it and when bharat qr was launched there were 14 banks which were ready on february uh, 19th 2000 Uh, 17. That was when Bharat Pay was launched by RBI in in presence of all the payment uh, schemes like Visa, Mastercard, Rupee, and all. And we had eight of them. Eight banks were out of 14 were our customers. We were able to quickly spin it off because we just made it into three different APIs. That's all. One for payment, one for status check, one for reversal. That's it. Right? We were able to easily integrate with all these eight banks and make them feel comfortable. And that was ready. And we thought that will actually become big one day yes it did not the regular card schemes it the upi piece alone took off really well all of the investments that we had made it still paid off the upi piece really took off and where upi is today and right? it's like the mainstay of digital payments in india hmm i, I want to like just recap and understand a bit better so once you raised the funds then you hired a team to build more of the tech in house uh, as you right. built the card stack in house uh, and then you wanted to invest in building tech for uh, m visa you said what is m visa so visa had come up with their own standard called m visa mastercard had come up with their own standard called masterpass qr and rupe had rupe qr right and all these things were different streams right we had built a capability to these were uh, documents that were available so we had to just build to read the qr understand the qr understand its language and call an api or visa or mastercard and make the payment so we had done that like a laboratory we had built a lab and we, a couple of developers were assigned for it and we said like why don't we be that player because m visa was launched as a global product it is still a global product wherever visa is present you can enable m visa as a, a capability as okay, an issue okay okay right? so uh, is there something you you would find at a merchant outlet where you can right. scan with your phone and pay correct okay correct, correct. so you built something which would allow a bank or a paytm or any of these companies to just integrate with your product and be able right. to scan any qr code because you right. got the documentation for every type of qr code so you built something right. which would scan any qr code and then know what is the 
location where the money has to be sent correct exactly it's a, it is more like a language we set the grammar for the language and we were ready we understood the language and uh, that standard was we in fact standardized more and made sure that it is very easy people did not really build that qr reading technology again and all we just made small sdks code snippets for it and gave it to the customers so we were able to integrate and go live in a matter of 2 3 weeks but you said that eight banks launched something which was compatible with bharat qr so you're talking yeah. of the mobile banking app which right. had a scanner to read the, so that scanner was powered by your sdk exactly what i'm what i was trying to say was that a team of probably 10 12 people at that time integrating with eight banks just imagine one person assigned to one bank also it's like very hard to achieve and right? we were able to do because that's the power of automation and power of technology right if you are able to simplify the technology to its most granular detail it kinds of pays off it rewards you with attaining scale in a very quick fashion right so we were able to quickly scan so that was when we moved away from just working with dcb bank we of course we onboarded as bank also as a partner mm-hmm. by 2016 for the uh, also, prepaid card product prepaid card product and then we also enabled equitas small finance bank they were just born like equitas was mfi we had tied up with them for the mfi business but the moment they were given with the banking license the day they were born as a bank we were there already so th- we had only three banks to do this prepaid capability and all and then with qr code enablement we had suddenly we had over a dozen banks enabled in a gfi right by mid 2017 we had over 12 or 13 banks live with us this qr code business uh, help me understand that business so i understand the prepaid card business where you are helping lenders to issue prepaid cards and then you earn pennies on the dollar which is shared between the bank the lender and you what is the qr code business there like what is so, hmm. yeah qr code business again it's a transactional business where whenever the customer transacts there is some portion that is collected as fee the same mdr applies in qr code also just that it was going fine for about a year or so and then government intervened and said we want to push digital payments we want to remove mdr on qr payments so we only had a rental or a saas kind of model for qr payments beyond that like the moment it became free we said like, we'll just keep it like a saas kind of model we just pay for a subscription fee for enabling that capability we didn't really go with a transaction based revenue and of course every other player in the industry with upi that is the problem upi gives you scale it gives you a lot of data it gives you a lot of transaction volume however revenues with respect to upi nobody makes any money yeah yeah it's, it's just like a top of the funnel for companies right, hmm. right. so uh, that one year in which you were sharing the mdr with the banks that was for doing what for giving them the ability to read a qr code yeah we were doing everything so effectively what they did was their mobile banking app when they open that scan and pay option it's just it just transfers to our territory right they just don't do anything they had to write no code they just had to read the qr and then our sdk to go over so for them it is say for example i'll tell you uh, i'll just give you a a model change request for a bank right like software companies which used to charge banks on upon every change request they generally used to contract with the bank using a tender or an rfp process they sign up using at a loss okay and then they make money with every change request like a small change request like that would have easily built for the bank by the software company for about 25 30 lakhs what we charged was some 20 30k so it makes a lot of difference right got it got it okay 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 yeah essentially it becomes a no code solution for a bank then Exactly. the way an e-commerce company can have just a payment gateway through a simple integration right. a bank can add a qr payment option in its app just through a simple integration so right. just that uh, we were naive and we didn't know to name it as no code at that time <laughs> 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 okay 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 got it okay uh, uh, so uh, initially this was like a revenue share but once the mdr got eliminated then you switched into a fixed fee subscription model yeah, subscription kind of model yeah. okay 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 but Got yeah it. so the qr code so i'll tell you this right like in our mind like in our mind map what we do for core infrastructure was 
going to be the one which is going to earn our revenue and pay our salaries but your heart is always tilted towards things that are the stuff that you perceive that this will be the future we'll have to keep investing even though there is no return on investment in the ne- near future so qr code payments were one such approach yeah it was a bet and we had to it is a very small bet very low cost bet the only thing that was required was human effort which we were able to put at that point of time so we build that to be that leader when it comes to, as and when there is a time when it like when qr payments become huge let's say globally if at all qr payments are taken off really well we could have easily gone and corporate bombed several countries and done that but yeah so it was quite a good learning curve for us like we we understood that when there is something that requires a habit change for the customer it takes at least 2 to 3 years of big tech players to invest make sure that habit change happens because google pay and phone pay and all these guys pumped in heavy dollars like paytm they did that huge uh, respect to them because they did that and now many people at least in the urban centers if you see most of us don't carry a wallet which has uh, cash we we just go with our mobile phone and we complete our day to day purchases so that requires so we understood that it's not easy to just build the technology customer change requires a lot of time lot of reinvestment a lot of habit changing exercises that had to they had to go through and if they find value they will do it okay by 2019 what kind of revenue were you at and was it still funded by that one friends and family round you did yes yes so what okay. so i covered till 2017 by 2017 we had already certified on rupee we requested visa and mastercard certification as well and we got it done over that 2017 period so 2017 was more like a very pivotal year for us we invested at least for 5 years into the future at that one year we thought we we built we said to ourselves that we will we will be at a very handsome kind of revenue by 2022 like back in 2017 we thought we will be at a 100 crore plus revenue if we are able to put in the right ingredients at that time and we started cooking right so we got certified on all the three major networks in india we got certified for prepaid as well as credit card uh, and debit card of course so what we did was right after that we built a product called multi currency travel card that was a product you would have traveled abroad you would have taken prepaid dollar card or multi currency travel card it was a product that was not at all intervened over the last 2 3 decades ever since thomas cook and cox and kings of the world had some offering it was just remaining as it is nobody intervened so we thought we had a lot of ideas around it now that we have built the card capabilities can we start intervening more into how the experience looks and all that we built an app for it we built capabilities like you go abroad right when i myself and madhu visited barcelona in 2018 there was absolutely no idea where to locate an atm where to locate a restaurant and all these things even though google maps were there the meaningful data where there are atms which does not have a surcharge if you go and withdraw using a hdfc card in an atm in europe there is something called a surcharge that is applied like a convenience fee that is applied in europe things that are not head of in india right here we have three transactions free over there there is nothing free right so all these information are available in a visa api stack which we can actually build and make it into an app so we built that in 2018 we built that right after we had all the networks in place the network technologies in place we started building capabilities like we initially began with multi currency travel card as a core product and then we enabled that for several companies like cox and kings uh, for yes bank for my forex several customers got onboarded in that and then that took off really well that took off and went as one of our big revenue drivers at least 20 25% of our revenues were using the multi currency travel card from late 2018 till early 2020 when covid happened and the entire travel industry came to a standstill so multi currency uh, travel card must be a lot more profitable because uh, people load load like dollars or euros so like much higher uh right. l- like that fdr earning would be much higher therefore that's true that's true yes that was one of the reasons why we wanted to invest there because it was like an incremental innovation over and above what we had already built we had built a multi wallet capability card here which you can have a general wallet fuel wallet food wallet and all that we had to do was like each wallet had to be in a different currency so we had to make incremental changes to what we had already built we didn't needn't have to reinvent the entire thing so it was i would say uh, like a automatic choice for any engineering team to take it as the next iteration iteration 
So we did that. Right after mm-hmm. we did that, the and same the problem. The revenue model was the same that is shared between all three parties. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in multi capital card, there are ma- many other revenue uh, streams as well. As a customer, currency change when, rate. Right. The the currency exchange rate. There is a, a there is a, like a spread there, and then there's something called as markup that banks apply. And then there is this you know, cross currency charges when you load your card with dollars and spend in dirhams. Let's say from INR you load to dollar, and then when you spend in dirham, of course there is a two two levels of conversion that happens in every level you get to earn. So multi currency was definitely if you make it right, if you price it, it is definitely going to give you good amount of returns in the longer run. That was very clear, and that's the reason we invested in that, and we were still bootstrapped. We were not. We hadn't raised any funding other than the small hmm. friends and family round. Friends and family. This uh, is something this, uh, that I'm talking about in 2018. Uh, I have some more questions on the multi currency card. So, uh, in yeah. this multi currency card, who does the uh, exchanging of currency? The bank does it. The issuing bank. Yes, the the issuing banks do that. There is a function called treasury in every bank, which actually do the trade, right? Like the forex, they sit at the forex desk and do the actual trading every card that you roll you'll have to the bank has to take a position there right? they have to whether they have to buy dollars or buy dirhams or buy uh, euros they have to take a position there and we built workflows for all that we had to work so that was again a huge learning curve how treasury works how to because these are things that are core to every bank this is not known by outsiders at all right it's even for the people who are called as insiders in the fintech industry even for them it'll be like a huge learning curve we had to go sit with a bank, sit with an operation guy who actually takes positions in a forex desk uh, or a treasury desk. It is completely different. Like I had not experienced that ever before. Madhu had that experience because he, prior to Visa, he used to work with Thomas Cook for a few years. In Thomas Cook, he was the one who launched the forex card product of Thomas Cook. So he had that idea. So we had built using his, like he, even though he runs the business end of the company, he's a very good product guy in our uh, company most of the requirements come from him he'll at least give it as like a very top level requirement and then we'll have to go back and research and you know find out more but yeah okay and which were the issuing banks for this whom all did you tie up with the same set of banks yeah so s bank was major s bank was one of the biggest bank of Baroda was next that i'll talk about that was in 2019 we enabled bank of Baroda. dcp of course we had and then i think yeah th- those were the three major banks that we went ahead with multi-currency product. Yeah, then from that 2018, you launched multi, multi-currency. multi And then we we thought the same problem is there with the credit card uh, industry as well. Uh, credit cards were boring. The only thing that happened to credit cards was with the advent of Flipkart and Amazon, you started seeing more cashbacks, right? You really did not have any sort of product intervention in credit cards at least for the last 15, 20 years, ever since Citibank came, Standard Chartered came and started giving cards. We never saw any intervention, but we thought there were so many lending fintechs who wanted to launch credit cards, but it was prohibitively expensive. There are few companies uh, which offer the credit card stack like Fiserv, uh, First Data, who has a product called Vision Plus. It was quite expensive. It's a very good product. Very, I would say it's a huge enterprise level product used by the SBIs and HDFCs of the world. Of course, it comes at a price, right? And not all capabilities or all uh, that scale is required by smaller banks. Let's let's take a bank like City Union Bank in Chennai or a Equitas Bank in Chennai or a South Indian Bank in Kerala. All these banks are of a book size of anywhere between three to ten thousand dollars, uh, ten thousand crores. For them, this was huge investment. Like this, I'm talking about investments like a million dollars every year. It's not easy for them to run a software stack at that bare minimum cost. So we thought we can again, anything and everything that we do, we are very uh, clear about not having a lot of CapEx discussions. Because the moment you get into a CapEx kind of discussion, the bank would talk about ROI and all these things. So we always take an iterative iterative approach. We tell the bank that you can take it in an OPEX model, pay as you go. If it succeeds, all of us succeed and all of us get to share the profits. If it doesn't, it's fine. We invested, we learned and we'll move on. So that's the approach that we took and that kind of worked. That's when SBM Bank India happened. This was early 2019 when SBM Bank, SBM stands for State Bank of Mauritius. They have a wholly owned India subsidiary, 
which is given with a full bank license, fully uh, full uh, schedule and commercial bank license. So SBM Bank India happened, and that's when we partnered with them. A uh, bunch of very talented guys joined there. Some ex colleagues of Madhu and Muthu as well. So we partnered and gave all our capabilities there. We thought we will build an entire banking stack, like bank banking stack in the sense, except the core banking solution. Let's build everything, whatever capabilities that a fintech would normally want. Can we build a Solaris bank or can we build a digital only bank for the masses, right? For the fintechs. So that was the kind of uh, journey that we took up with SBM Bank. I think. Uh, two or two and a half years later, I think we have achieved a decent amount of traction there with the vision that we set out to do together back in 2019. So what we started building was we thought we'll build a credit card stack, full blown credit card stack, a full blown, you know, debit card stack, a full blown neo banking stack. All these were three major product lines that we set out to do. Right? This was early, like late 2018, early 2019. We started building, and these three were run as three different product units within the company. We had uh, from an architect to a fresher, we had a full set of people. Uh, I would say we were about 40, 45 odd people at that time as a company. At least 20 of them were engineers. And between those engineers, some five or six were supporting the earlier customers and integrations and stuff. The remaining people were deployed in building all these three stacks. So the 2019 was the year of we building a credit card stack and a new banking stack. 2018 was the year of we building the Forex stack. And then 2020 was the year of actually scaling all these things. Like all these were ingredients that we put to put into cooking the uh, overall stuff, right? And then this started really coming up or started scaling in 2020, early 2020. All these things, all these products were launched by at least one big fintech. Like the Forex card was launched by Wall Street Forex, Book My Forex. All these are fintechs who want to do uh, something big in the multi-currency industry. The neo banking stack was launched by Finin, which was which recently got acquired by Bank Open. That was the only neo banking app where you can do a fully blown digital onboarding and all. And then the credit cards were adopted by several places like Paisa Bazaar, Carbon, Kodo, Encash, several corporate and consumer credit card uh, companies. All of them use our stack. And we the model that we took was that each and every one of these companies had their own USP. They had their own method towards the user experience and stuff. So what we did was instead of we saying, hey, these are my bunch of APIs, you'll have to use it whether you like it or not. That was not the approach that we took. What we did was we understood that we cannot innovate everything. There are innovators. Why don't we partner with them, co-create products with them? So we also are part of the innovation journey. So that was the approach that we took. So we said to ourselves that one day we will become like a Play Store or an App Store for fintechs. Give them what they want. And on the other side, we become an operating system of sorts for banks, right? And then over a period of time, when all of these things come, you know, good, over a period of time, we can become more like a global super network of sorts, right? That that vision was quite visible in late 2019. And that's when we started this process of why don't we raise funds and expand globally? Because for India, we were self-sufficient, we were able to pay our salaries, we were able to keep churning out products and uh, platform cop uh, capabilities. Why don't we take it global? Uh, what that kind of when, revenue were you doing in by 2019? I That was sub-million dollars, about uh, five to seven crores is, was the rough amount of revenue that we were making. It was flat for two years because we were building, right? So between 2017 and 19, the revenue was stuck between four to seven crores. It, was, it did not really multiply. But 2020 onwards, it just started that hockey stick growth was seen 2020 Jan onwards. Of course, in Mar between March, April and May, we had a dip. There was there were two reasons for it. Yeah, two reasons for it. March, S Bank went into moratorium. Several of our heavy programs were tied up with S Bank. So the settlement was stopped. The bank was asked to shut its business. And uh, one month of that moratorium affected our revenues for a while. But luckily, we were funded by then. We raised our seed funding. Our Series A was done by then. So we did not struggle for cash, but revenue definitely took a beating. And right after that, we had the lockdown. I still vividly remember the dates, right? March 23rd, the government of India announced that India is going to enter into a lockdown. And uh, 25th, the moratorium on S-Bank was released. It was like one was done, one lock was out, and the other lock is in. And then all of April and May, we were all struggling. So that one uh, three-month or four-month period was the only blip in our overall journey. 
again the but same thing uh, fdr based earnings should have been unaffected because everyone would be transacting and digital transaction card payment would have gone up yeah so during the lockdown the travel was completely stopped so travel ah, card okay. was 25 30% of revenue right right right, right. Mm-hmm. only online commerce was uh, picking up so that yeah. spread yeah. between yeah. physical atm and online mm-hmm. the online channel started really taking off mm-hmm. that we were able mm-hmm. to see mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. course the travel related mm-hmm. spend started really yeah, yeah, having yeah. that must have crashed yeah yes. mm-hmm. Okay, yes. okay, okay. I want to uh, ask questions here before we move ahead. Sure. The credit card stack that you built, did you build it the way you built the prepaid stack and the forex stack, where you imagined third parties to use it, or did you also build for a bank to issue credit cards to their own customers? I think prepaid was the only thing that we took out any kind of rented pro- product. Hmm. right after that we no, said no, no. to ourselves by third party like prepaid was built for third parties to issue prepaid cards using this like a right. nbfc can issue prepaid card of a bank using this so the credit card product was built with the same thought that an external like a fintech company can issue credit cards using this and collaborating with the bank or was it built yes. so that the bank can issue cards to their own customers yes there were two use cases for credit cards one was for the smaller banks we definitely can't go and really crack bigger banks at that point of time being a small company with a new product they wouldn't want to risk their business because credit card is like a mainstay business for many of the banks like hdfc have built an empire with credit card right so definitely we were consciously staying away from bigger banks like i say say hdfc we did not even go and pitch even one product to them at that point of time we wanted the credit card product to be with a two pronged approach one is the partnership approach like the likes of carbon kodo and all these companies where there is a corporate card offering that they want we will give them the credit card suit that was one angle the second angle was can we have smaller banks that play the fintech role themselves if at all they have the appetite to issue credit cards smaller bank become a slice is a question that we ask for ourselves we are not going to lose any money on that we just have to do the sales cycle and many banks are actually seen to be quite interested in doing that they want to build a credit book because see wh- one thing is for sure right like when there is a bank which partners with fintechs what st- sticks to the customer's mind is not the bank's brand it's always the so customer a swiggy customer using a swiggy money wallet sticks to swiggy they don't know that it's powered by icic icic had to create their own brand awareness elsewhere like a pockets or a imobile or something else so every bank would definitely whoever are brand conscious definitely want to venture into something that is fintech friendly or the customer friendly gives a better user experience and all that so when we built it we made sure that we white label it and make sure we can adapt it for every bank's needs so it was okay. a two pronged attack but would you also enable banks to do regular credit card business like uh, you you were mentioning very small banks uh, who are like yes. say 3000 crore size so those kind of banks could do their traditional credit card through this that was part yes. of the product was yes. built like that have- okay correct in fact we have we have in fact closed down on several banks like that i'm not naming the banks because of non disclosure reasons but yeah several banks have signed up like at least half a dozen banks have signed up and they're going to launch some of them have launched in a closed loop kind of manner for their own employees so it's really chugging along very well it is because they don't incur capex as i told you a bigger platform in 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 like they have to incur a lot of capex and not more and many banks yeah they cannot show that roi for such a huge spend so we have made it into a plug and play pay as you go model as they issue more cards they have they just pay us so that is really it's a model that we have found as working okay uh, very well okay and the bank does not even need to do uh, any of those online integrations like for people to see what is their due amount for people to pay the bill and even the bank can offer them an app which is essentially your white label app so right. uh, everything which a bank needs to do to issue a credit card is just like a plug and play pay as you go available to them on tap that's right that's right so we call it as three different capabilities right like one is the admin or the management center which is done by the bank's product team or the business team which actually you know runs the pnl for the bank that is one module the second module is the support center which is like the call center or the contact center that the bank has or the branches that they have who where you as a customer if you go and say hey i have lost my card why don't you block it they can immediately do that quick service right 
and then the third is a self care option for the customers which will be an app or a, a mobile or a web page right which again is a self care portal where you as a customer can go and see your transaction download statements and all that so we offer these three plus the bunch of apis for partner integrations as one box got it okay 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 got it and the revenue for you is uh, those two streams one issuance at the time of issuance some fixed amount and a mdr share and uh, the so, underwriting I mean, we is... have taken correct so we have taken a lot of inspiration from saas on this right like you have an one time fee and a recurring revenue which makes it much more easier for you to predict how the future is going to be at least for the near future like one year Uh, from here you will be able to understand what will be your rough numbers with so many customers on board it what about the underwriting for the, like the risk assessment for issuing credit card do you give a product for that also or that is bank's internal yes. process we do give a product for that so we we do have that entire layer of contacting the bureau getting the data the customer only keys in his mobile number or pan number and the remaining is done by the our system where you get the data present it in a meaningful manner to the bank there is a workflow for it that's the admin module that i mentioned about the admin gets to see the options what are the key things that the bank wants to decide like his credit score or his repayment how many defaults has he done in over the last 3 years there are several decision decisioning factors that are there we also have our own risk scoring methodology but the bank need not you know rely on that we can always say these are the truth truths about the customer you can decide and then they approve or decline and then they set the credit limit for the customer it's just one workflow where they just have to do this that's all yeah, and the so, bank would also have a savings account for that customer so they would be able to look at that absolutely. data in addition to the bureau absolutely. data and then make absolutely. a decision so hmm. what this has enabled is wherever they have salary accounts kind of relationships they automatically spin off a credit card because they know that this much amount of salary is going to come to the customer so there is a lot of product cross selling and cross pollination that is possible when you go and you know have a bank work like a fintech it it has a lot of rewards and we also what we have done is we have also told the bank that there is even though we don't use huge industry jargons like aml and all these things we don't go and you know bombard them with all these jargons we just tell them hey the decisioning system is going to get better over a period of time if this spread of customers where the credit score is between 750 to 800 the salary is about 30000 to 60000 and these are the factors you can automate it it is your option right we give them the aml capabilities without telling them that this is like these jargons we make it idiot proof and tell them that boss if these are the formula that you are applying for every adjudication we can automate it for you so you don't have to waste your warm bodies in going and clicking that approve button hmm, hmm. so that is also a capability hmm. that we have offered hmm. okay amazing okay and what about collections and uh, stuff like that yeah. do you give them some tool for that like that is the the, the toughest part of the lending business is getting Absolutely. the money back lending is all about yeah yeah madhu keeps telling this lending is all about collections lending anybody can do <laughs> collecting is where the art is so collections we did we did catch up with several bright minds around collections we in fact zeroed in on one such person who is venkatesan you would have seen an announcement of ours over the last one year we had acquired a company called origa.ai who are specifically into collections we first thought we'll tie up with somebody and give that combined stack as a single stack because we didn't have a lot of experienced people in our product team who had done that collections and collections risk and all these things so we thought we'll go and take expert advice and see if we can do a, a co-creation of a product uh, with some other company and then this this overall approach worked right origa ai was looking for an external or a strategic partner and then the deal happened and we were able to kind of acquire them so we did a we did a joint exercise and we are now offering that as a joint suit so wherever we offer credit card or any lending product like a bnpl or any lending product we also offer the collections platform of origa along with that So what does a collections platform look like what is a collections so, tool of course there are multiple options one is to collect money digitally you have this virtual account or you pay using a uh, cred or any other payment model it is collected and apportioned to the correct card and whenever there is a collection that happens how do you knock off the balance if there is interest charge if it is a customer who revolves how do you knock off which transaction you knock off so that entire piece is built by us the Origa piece gives us that adapters to collect money and uh, push it to the right card and make sure that the payment is reflected. And then 
origa specifically gives capabilities for all types of collections right the bank will on one side they will have digital channel to collect online there is second part which is like the bill desk or a credit which is the partner channel the third is the fleet on street right so you have collection agents or agencies which are uh, you know tasked to go and collect money which will be like they collect in cash or they collect in uh, check or whatever and then that clearance and everything has to be managed and then it has to be accounted for so this entire piece three different models are built by origa and uh, that is something that we offer today and this is a uh, india focused product no this is a global problem collections is a lo- global problem in india it's more so because we still don't like i think most of the people who have access to credit still don't understand that their bad behavior with respect to payments or on time payments is going to affect them for a very long period in terms of their credit score and all that so it's more to do with awareness right whereas in the us credit builder products and credit scoring and everything is like very sorted 16 year olds and 20 year olds understand that very well whereas here it's still but what we see is collections as a product the digital channels at least is applicable in every market we have seen good acceptance for that in the uae in the gcc region and even in the southeast asian markets wherever we are doing research now okay 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 got it okay i have understood all the three major products now the, uh, no i have understood forex credit card prepaid what about the neo banking stack yeah so neo banking is something okay so how, how we approach neo banking was that what banks had to offer was more like a tailor it was not like a tailor made product for a specific class of people right what finin wanted to do what slice wants to do what uni wants to do all these are players who want to who approach neo banking in a different manner altogether what jupiter is doing is a very different model so each of these neo banks want to do a solution or build a solution or build a platform or build a experience for their target segment slide is very clear that they want to build for young adults right 20 to 25 is the age group that they are going after uni is for the people who kind of purchase and uh, make it like in the one third of an make it divide by three right pay in three segments right uh, one card is for the elite group where they have established credit card credit cards already in their pocket and they want to make you uh, one card as the primary brand or primary card that they use and all that right they offer a very premium metal card and all that so every or every fintech has a different uh, target group that they are going after uh, there are also farmer near banks that are getting built today specifically attracting farmers telling them what are the interest rates and all these things so very different use cases so new what one what banks cannot do is when it comes to near banking of course all our indian banks if you see they have a very good presence in terms of mobile banking in terms of upi in terms of internet banking almost every bank offers that free of cost right so it's not the regular capabilities regular suspects that the near banking startups want to solve it's a different proposition altogether which we understood right it's a, it's a matter of giving more value for every money that is transacted using the near bank is what we need to give so it was a natural choice for us to build that near banking as a capability so what we did was with sbm bank as to begin with we built an entire capability around opening an account with a fully digital kind of onboarding channel and attaching other products like a credit card or a bnpl line or a credit line or an nbfc credit line so we were able to give not just a near banking platform we were able to give a lot of bells and whistles as well we are adding loyalty rewards to that section we are adding in some point of time we will be adding an insurance uh, or a gold savings or investment kind of an option very soon so these are things that will add to the overall experience for a user so you don't go to jupiter for doing one thing and then go to india gold or safe gold for doing another thing if, if everything is offered in one app you kind of use it like a super app that's where neo banking is going towards and that's where we are building towards as well okay like uh, for you to build neo banking uh, a lot of your existing stack is already done like one right. part of neo banking is uh, credit card for example or debit card so both debit and credit card you already built technology yes. for it the uh, other stuff that you have to build is like account opening that transactions of KYC. your account like yeah. kyc the transfer money transferring bill payments uh, and then reward points and okay mm-hmm. right and and so, what, yeah sorry th- those were the incremental things that we had to do 
in late 2019, early 2020, those were the incremental capabilities that we had to build to enable Neo banking in a meaningful manner. And Finin as an app had all that. And then we also had to enable UPI so that the transactions are seamless and all that, which we did over a period of time. For a person, for a founder who's considering starting a fintech, then essentially say Kodo or Finin, these would not really need to have a CTO in place as such. They would rather need to have a design team in place to figure out the customer experience and things like that. But the tech can just be a plug and play from uh, M2P. Yeah, so if it is a fintech startup that works really well, if it is a startup that is entering into a Swiggy, right? Say, for example, Swiggy, food tech or Insta delivery is their main offering, then they definitely need a CTO to take care of their core business. They don't need a payments expert because we are there. So that's how, so on, on the fintech startup side, we can be that all encompassing kind of player, which saves them a lot of dollars in terms of not reinventing things that are already done by us. So that's there. And for companies, so that's what we believe, right? Like our thesis is that we think every company across the globe can hmm. become a fintech. You what can what is uh, Swiggy's uh, fintech play here? A wallet, like a prepaid wallet? You load the wallet and... Or, or not a just a prepaid wallet. Or... Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Not just a prepaid wallet. Uh, there are several things that are, you know, uh, coming up. There'll be a BNPL offering. There'll be like, you can actually, uh, you can make that entire piece of ordering food like a, in a one-click kind of model. You don't have to even enter any credentials, no fingerprint, nothing. You can power, uh, power several things, right? Not just the current use cases. Let's say there is this option of using Swiggy Genie for something. You can pay for something from here. Like today, it is like a cash and carry you can pay. It's not that it's not being paid. There is a cash and carry that you don't do as a customer, but the agent who goes to the store is actually paying cash. Let's say you ask a Swiggy Genie to go and collect a shirt from a tailor. Okay. Swiggy Genie is goes, like a Dunzo kind of a service. Exactly. Like on demand rider. Hmm. Exactly. They run on a cash and carry kind of model. They go to the local agent get the money and then go pay the money to the tailor and then come and collect it. you. You might have probably done digital uh, payment, but the actual, the, in the entire ecosystem, it's not fully digitized. So we are also digitizing on the other side. We are working with Swiggy and such companies on the other side to see how we can digitize their entire journey. Okay, so the delivery executives can be issued a card that they can use to pay, uh, like an expense card, basically. What right. happy had launched i think happy got acquired recently but yeah something like that exactly exactly very similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are several use cases so that's what so uh, when we go take a specific business mm -hmm. any kind of commerce happens there will be mm -hmm. payments yeah and we yeah, think yeah. there is an angle of fintech that can you know intervene mm -hmm. into that payments and make it much better mm -hmm. or like so a, Ola or a uber could issue a card to the drivers to use for petrol payments mm -hmm. through which they could earn some points and like that exactly. that or they could help them to finance the purchase of a vehicle. So, so all these fintech kind of opportunities, you would be able to directly hook them up with a bank to enable this. Exactly. In fact, we work with Ola. Ola is one of the big tech players. We work with them very, we power two different products for them. One is on this Ola money side, the postpaid offering, the BNPL offering that they have, that's one. The regular Ola money wallet, you can attach a card, that's another. And then the third driver module is something that we have been doing as a proof of concept for them. They have tried it out in Bangalore and few other cities. It is yet to take full shape. But yeah, that they see that as a big, what do you call it, a problem. Because no Ola, money, Ola driver is ready to accept the money as a mode of payment. They ask, they call you and ask you like, sir, where to go? Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> cash, no, will you pay cash or cash? Ola money. <laughs> yes. So we want to solve the problem. We are working with them closely yeah. and trying to solve So it. they'll issue a card to the driver and as soon as the trip is completed, the money goes into the card for the driver. So, right. so that way, right. driver payout is instant yes something like that exactly yeah. you nailed okay. it okay okay and what about this credit card the linking to the what do you do in that yeah so there is a there is a postpaid kind of uh, offering that ola has there is a card attached to it like ola money themselves have a ppi license they are a prepaid issuer they acquired a company called zipcash back in 2016 or 17 so that the card that we offer, it's a MasterCard uh, card, which we offer, which dips into the same wallet. So we give that entire layer around card issuing and enable that interoperability for them. So you don't have to necessarily use Ola money only to pay to Ola drivers. 
that you can pay elsewhere you can use it like a regular store of value you were talking about like a series a uh, in about 2019 was it not? like after that initial friends and family round what, what next did you do in terms of fundraise so we didn't do anything <laughs> we did not do anything around funding at all even though madhu was connected to several investors not many understood our business so we tried reaching out to large investors in late 2019 to check do a dipstick check of how how and how much money can we raise and all that we knew that we had a, we had put together a plan we traveled to the to dubai we traveled to abu dhabi understand the market we thought there is huge play when it comes to this, this push payments model is also applicable for remittances right if you want to send money from india to uh, the world or from anywhere to india there is it's a push payment you are trying to push money to somebody else's account there so we thought like we can also participate in remittances but remittances was already like a commoditized business so we thought like we could do something uh, different there and we I, like we figured out that there are zeroed in on few use cases which we want to kind of power and then we found out that earning in inr and spending in dirhams or dollars doesn't work the math will never work if at all you want to go in step st- step into any new market you will have to probably raise funds or find a local partner who can actually infuse the capital so that you can go in the initial bit of time to research and ensure the product goes live so that's when we thought we should set offices probably in singapore and dubai and understand the market and go go big right land there first and then expand start expanding so we reached out to several large investors in fact there was a lot of inbound interest we started honoring it took it very seriously did those exercises two three months passed and then we figured out that straight away going into a big vc and raising funding is going to eat at least 6 to 8 months of our time so we thought like we'll we'll just first go talk to some experts like ex entrepreneurs or people like super angels who have already exited a profitable business and all understand how it you know how to do this and all right we met amrish rao who is an ex you know sit ceo of citrus pine labs yeah pay current ceo of pine labs we met him in singapore madhun muttu met him in singapore he was immediately hooked on to the idea he said how much of money you want you will have to first start small and then you can always have several rounds of funding raised over a period of time we took his advice very seriously we took we in fact wanted him on board we requested him to come as an advisor he was really very helpful very kind of him to have done that and he also put in some money so we raised about 1 1 1/2 million dollars about 10 crores of money we raised in jan feb 2020 that was the first uh, funding round which was like a seed round which we raised outside of our friends and family and uh, even by the time uh, we executed and got the money in the bank we had already signed up with b next for a series a they said we are ready to let you complete your uh, funding round because b next had invested in amrish amrish's earlier venture citrus payments which got acquired by payu and there was a lot of that was a time when visa wanted to acquire played in the us and there was a lot of talk around payments infrastructure being a, an integral component to build a scalable business so when when people started looking around for companies which are similar there were very few across the world even today even though there are several startups which want to do it companies which have attained certain amount of scale decent scale to say they have built a meaningful infrastructure are very few i would say in a continent there are only two or three like whole of europe there are few companies like revolut and you know monzo and there are very few companies which have actually built infra and the front facing apps we did that by april 2020 we had a series a also done and we had the dry powder to start executing we set up our first international office in series a was 5 million dollars 4.5 million dollars to be precise we had about 5.5 million dollars in the bank we initially wanted to first set foot in abu dhabi we went to abu dhabi global market which is like a, a reg lab the government's offshore uh, model where you can you as a foreign company can go and set up a subsidiary there and all that we did that we had our first team come on board like vanati who who leads our meena business that entire region business she joined us along with a team of four five people that's this was august 2020 and then yeah we have really the uae business or the, the idea of setting up base in dubai or abu dhabi was 
to keep that as the regional base we wanted to cover several countries in that region we in fact have signed up with at least four or five different markets in that region already we have live implementations going on but the team sits out of dubai majority of, we have a 25 30 member team there sitting out of dubai and abu dhabi taking care of the entire region so you've tied up with banks there is it the same play have a bank partner and then allow Absolutely. other companies to offer like prepaid forex credit card all of these through that bank Absolutely. partner yes absolutely we we tied up with one of the largest banks there fab first abu dhabi bank and also another bank called emirates nbd these are the two larger banks like icic and hdfc in india so uh, they would probably be the one among the top 50 banks across the world in terms of asset size yeah so that gives us access to not just uae also ancillary markets like bahrain saudi uh, qatar and all the, uh, the entire pan gcc region we have access to and we have also st- set foot in egypt this year we have also enabled uh, qatar bahrain mm. and what UAE. kind of fintechs are you tying up with them? what kind of products are are going live like i think all kinds i would say uae or the gcc region in terms of fintech activity is very similar to how it was in 2015 in india similar journey is being seen there companies are trying with banks they are trying to launch co-branded products prepaid like wallet for specific use cases bnpl for use cases like flipkart and there is a flipkart equivalent in ua it's called noon they are trying out very similar products like how flipkart or pay later products of amazon uh, so we see that that market gcc market is probably 3 or 4 years behind india when it comes to fintech action but they are just catching up i would say in the next 5 6 years they will probably catch up and you know be on par with what is happening here and there are also like there is a different type of methodology there it's not like rbi the central bank of uae also offers like e money licenses which for private entities which operate in a slightly different manner they are not allowed to do certain components of banking but they are able to do lending or you know financing and all the other stuff so it's slightly different and of course when you set foot to a land where islam is the prime religion you will also have to fine tune your product according to islamic banking and there is uh, the, the sharia law has certain portions where you are not supposed to do certain things like interest related stuff there are minor tweaks that we are supposed to do for the product or the way the fees and everything are applied which we have done over the last one month of years we have done so yeah slight differences are there but we see that there are a lot of i would say parallel lines that you can draw with india the this sharia law says uh, earning interest is haram right so uh, I, i thought banking works on interest and how do banks there uh, or is it just relabeled like the label changes so yes yeah, some are interest. relabeled hmm. yeah yeah you call uh, it something uh, else hmm. yeah not many people open savings account they are okay with current account like where it doesn't earn interest banks do not charge interest they instead charge a fee or you know some other line item like as like said, convenience like fees or a service fees or absolutely and it's a learning right like for us to charge just two line items in terms of commercial contracts over there when you get into see somebody else's commercial contract it's like 12 or 15 different line items you just get it it gets somewhat jittery for us so we still stick to our uh, model of keeping it very simple that has worked for us for a very long period in india i think that will work everywhere like build it in a frugal manner price it properly you can export to anywhere if it works in india it definitely has legs to work anywhere else. so that's the approach that we have taken we are sticking to the same formula of keeping the commercials and the line item simple so banks yeah they keep doing what they keep doing but uh, we saying we will not try it this model in this model we will go with a model which is like pay as you go and you know make sure that the business doesn't suffer because it's very expensive there like uh, ne- let me be very honest if you want to anything and everything that you take it's at least 3x of the cost of what you pay in india if you want a tech resource locally there you pay at least 3 to 4x on an office space it's 3x so you will have to make sure that uh, the business that launches along with you does not suffer in paying you also you should not be a, like a seen as a cost center there so that uh, we are working on that so that we are, we are uh, we are, so far we have been able to make sure 
several fintech companies have launched and uh, they are able to run their business comfortably so uh, do you do a bnpl product or do you enable fintechs to offer bnpl yeah yeah we do so that happened like la- since late 2020 we have also started building for bnpl bnpl of course it's like a chicken and egg problem you have more lenders you get more merchants you have more merchants lenders will be interested so you'll have to get a balance and i think we are in a good position to do justice to both sides because we on one side we work with a lot of nbfcs we can quickly enable another spin off another product for them and give them a meaningful i would say spread of merchants which would like to use a bnpl offering in their checkout experience so we are we've been able to hit a good amount of traction in fact we have uh, large banks like this was like a eye opener for us several large banks would want to enter into bnpl space for getting their target customer right because bnpl is like a very low cost customer acquisition strategy you offer a 2000 rupee 3000 rupee loan for a guy to buy a probably a mobile phone or a headset or something and then see his repayment behavior and then start betting bigger ticket sizes on him it's a very cool customer acquisition strategy for large banks so what we found out was on one side fintechs like lazy pay and all these guys want to offer bnpl and they have really done enough innovation to make sure that product is seamless and all that and on the other side banks want to use this as a tool for customer acquisition so it's going on very well and bnpl is gaining a lot of traction as you would, see, you would have seen it's one of the hottest investment areas in the last one one and a half years so, so yeah. like your bnpl product would be like a direct competitor to a simple or a lazy pay that's what you're building or you're no, building something yeah. which simple we and lazy pay will use at their back end yeah yeah so we work with them with lazy pay our offering is to enable a card on top of whatever they have to offer they don't have to build or we don't have to build the bnp layer for them they already have that they have established so we offer like other like cross pollinating other product lines along with their bnp layer is something that we are doing with them whereas for people who want to launch the bnp experience forget about amazon and flipkart right online commerce is still big beyond these two wikis it is still a huge market and every small merchant website will not be able to offer bnpl as an offering and similarly take razer pay or cash free or pay you these three big payment gateway companies they are able to offer bnpl by partnering with banks and all that uh, they are just offering or doing a payment gateway service of whatever the banks have to offer but there are so many other smaller payment gateway companies payment aggregators who want to enable bnpl as an option or emi payment as an option so we are able to find these white spaces and go go and cater to all these so that's mm. what we've been doing mm. with our bnp mm. product okay okay, okay quite a journey okay so uh, you're not building a bnpl which will directly compete with these bnpl startups but you're building the pipes enable other companies to come into this space say a cash free which is like a payment right. gateway solution they could start offering bnpl through your product absolutely or things like absolutely. that absolutely Yeah actually I think that is what is our strength right we do not want to compete with anybody we want to go along with them see so our thesis is to go and empower innovators like we are very clear very honest to ourselves that we cannot innovate everything there are people who are innovating how can you go help them if there are things that out of their journey if there are few areas that you have already solved for if you are able to help them and take the product to the market because market is the only validator right that's the only validation unless you take things to the market you don't know all other things like whatever research you do is all paperwork so how do we take it to market test it out and be iterative and make it better is the only thing that we are going after so we are very clear that we will not go enter into a lot of b2c play we'll make sure like we sit behind as the invisible layer to empower other innovators that's what we've been successful so far that's where we've been successful so far and i think for a good amount of the time to come we'll continue doing that okay uh, so you also raised a round with tiger global right like uh, after your series right. a what was next so omidyar was next series b omidyar was next omidyar is one of the one of the respected very well respected investment funds yeah global investors uh, they do a lot of due diligence they do very good analysis of how your metrics are are your margins really sustainable will they be compression margin compression or you know will they be competitors who would, who can come and eat your lunch all these things are 
uh, done by Omidyar over the course of their due diligence. And we went through that, right? We wanted that amount of rigidity in our PNL. It should be watertight. It should be built in such a manner that for the next five, six years, because everybody, if you see any company that attains up to a hundred million dollar or a, a kind of ballpark valuation, they start thinking about being a, becoming a unicorn and all that. The unicorn mindset has never stuck us because we think, can we build a company that can last 25 years without the founders? Right. So that's a fair uh, lifetime for a company. And then beyond that, it will only be like then leaders, what, how they take the company forward and all that. So that's what we are behind. We are not behind uh, a model where can we show certain numbers, can we show vanity metrics and beef of our valuation. That's not what we go behind. And people call it as a cockroach approach. Uh, can we make a cockroach company which can sustain any survive any kind of weather, any kind of uh, harsh environment. So that's what we are behind. With Omidyar, that thought process really got very well set with us. They did a lot of, they asked very good questions and that happened. The, this was March of 2021, last year. And right after we were done with Omidyar on, Tiger was interested. And the due to this of Omidyar was about $10 million, about $9.5 million. And then right after that, Tiger had shown interest, which was about a $35 million round. And the Tiger due diligence was like a breeze because Omidyar had covered almost everything, right? And Tiger guys were very open about what are the bets, what are the things that we know, what are the things that we need help. They were quite open. They gave us very good support in terms of doing some research outside because we told them like we're going to enter the Southeast Asian market and the GCC market. They had tried helping us with several uh, white papers and write introductions and stuff. They've been quite very active, very exciting to work with them because they just don't do this regular lip service of investors saying like, I'll do bring in all these synergies and all. They really do that, right? Like very silently, uh, they keep executing it. And I think right after that, Insight have also done our recent C1 round. Insight, this was more like a follow-on round, but we had to close that immediately back then because of various reasons. So we followed it up with the inside round. Again, the inside partners guys have been like phenomenal. Yeah, the round size was overall 35 million. Several earlier investors had also participated. Tiger led the round. Uh, with the inside, the recent round, it was 56 million. Yeah, 56 million of which the majority portion or the lead was taken by inside. And uh, Tiger also participated and all the earlier investors. So one good thing that we were very happy about was that BNX participated till the last round right which means like a, a company that came right in the series a have come along with you for the last next four rounds better capital participated in every round that they participated which is a validation that i think we all of us guys have been doing something right for these guys to show this amount of faith so we're just humbled by that gesture of theirs right? So this also adds to the uh, fact that we'll have to think much more deeply understand each and every action that we take every decision that we take in terms of growth or expansion or you know product line or any other future initiative that we take we are very clear that it has to be meaningful not just for ourselves not just for our folks who have worked with us it should also be meaningful for all these guys who have believed in us hmm. got it okay okay what was your valuation with this insight round it was a 600 605 million dollar valuation Okay, okay, okay. So I, I guess the next round will pretty much be a unicorn round, even though I know that's not yeah. what you are chasing. But mm. absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, if you do, like, we are overall thought process goes like this, right? Like the moment you make the company earn, make sure that it is sustainable. You are not reliant on the venture funding only for running the company. The company can run by itself. The funding is only to expand because. Expansion cannot be organic every time. You can go with an inorganic kind of a, explode and expand as well. Like Uber, Uber expanded to nearly 40, 50 countries in a year. It's not easy. They did that, right? So such expansion requires venture funding. So we understand that. So that's what we keep telling. Initial five years, we built like Zoho. And then the next two, three years, we've been building like Freshworks. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Both Chennai based companies. <laughs> okay. Yes. okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, w what was your revenue last financial year, 2021? It was, uh, so I, I can say I don't have a right exact figure. So, it was somewhere between 
I think we, I'll tell you the growth rate. We grew by about 3x in 2020 when we closed 2020, March 2020. We grew another 4-5x in 2021. We are looking at another 5 to 6x of growth this year. Like this year, you'll cross a 500 CR. Yes, we will. Amazing, amazing. Okay, yes. okay, okay. And what is the like? How much of this is from India? How much from outside? Like, what's the breakup of this revenue? So I would say 80 percent is from India even today. We have also expanded into Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, and Southeast Asia. We are enabling another three or four markets very soon. But all of these are early bits. GCC region has started. earning revenue all the contracts that we signed up in 20 early 2021 they've all gone live the the remaining 20% i would say is by all the other units put together i would say it's probably 85 15 uh, i would say but yeah i think another 5 or 6 years down the line the international yeah international business will be like surpassing the india revenues is what we are you know hoping for and in this revenue how much comes from like a subscription fees how much comes as your earning from mdr like, what is that break up like so see the one time fee or the sign up fee that we take from every fintech is more for validation to just that get that seriousness right that's not a big portion or big driver of our uh, this thing revenues that is but that is easily some 15 20% of our revenue book there are also and the subscription or the transaction based fee that we charge which in also includes the mdr portion is about uh, 50 55% and then there are uh, other avenues of revenue that we make by by doing some sort of uh, partnership or offering our platform as a service offering our infrastructure as a service for some companies these are things that are i would say uh, flat revenue models which is like monthly rental kind of models which is again another 20 25% Uh, so it's, tell me about this this 2025% give me some example of what you do so, here yeah so there are several companies who want to use our infrastructure just as a layer right they have built their own technology and all that there are several companies i'm not naming them here there are several companies which are using so we have direct rails to visa mastercard not many have that overall there are only uh, you know few hundred odd companies that have visa mastercard direct connectivity and so we have gone a uh, full vertical deep right if you want a visa product we have from their network connectivity visas routers and switches sit in our data center right we have an rj45 lan cable connecting from them to our routers right so we have direct plumbing into the uh, network so many payment gateway companies many card issuing companies use our platform in fact there are several startups again i'm not naming them there are several startups who use our pipes our platform as the base and they are wrapping it up over a bunch of their own apis and selling it outside and they claim it to be the fintech infrastructure but yeah more power to them they'll definitely one day build a full blown suit like us but we are very happy to empower such uh, model so that is about easily about 15 to 20% of i would say our revenues yeah okay this would be like a licensing fees that you would be charging here yeah probably how much of your uh, revenue comes through a bank like a paying you and how much comes through like a fintech partner paying you i would say it's probably probably 60 40 uh, or 60 40 towards the fintechs like several fintechs pays but overall i would say it's 50 50 yeah uh, because in several occasions where we pay the fintechs also the, there is a huge amount of share that we pay the fintechs as well like wherever there is mdr or interchange revenue we share a big portion with the fintech so we collect from the banks and pay to the fintechs and vice versa happens when the fintech brings the bank so what is yeah uh, what is the uh, what is your specific role like between the three co-founders who does what okay madhu is the business end of the company he runs the he heads the business units he works with rajesh wadwa in india who leads our india and southeast asia business he works with vanati to lead the gcc business and we have also appointed sanjoy and abhishek joined us recently abhishek is the ceo of paytm used to be the ceo of paytm payments bank and he joined us to take care of commercialization of several product lines so madhu heads the bunch of these guys and muthu runs the tech stack like he he builds the tech stack i take care of all the other thankless jobs in the company so in terms of operations infrastructure networking all the other stuff like infosec and i am a 
big believer of community driven approach we invested in a full blown marketing and branding and community unit to build a community for fintech so it's called tether we launched it in a very small manner so that is something that is my i would say i, I it's initiative from my end where i want to kind of build it to a meaningful uh, size over the next 2 3 years what is tether is it like say like a place where you help developers to understand how to use m2p products and is that what like, like building a right. developer community around m2p like is that the goal or yeah not just a developer community it's more uh, like a community for fintechs to begin with we'll start with fintechs then we can add other associated techs also but it's a community for fintechs anybody who wants who has a fintech concept who want to bring their idea to real life can they use it can, they can join the community ask questions so we're building it into a community where it it becomes less about m2p more about fintech right and any ideas that they want to take it uh, to market we can we can package several of our products into a box and give it offer it to these community players to go test out and uh, do that again going back to the same thesis we believe that we can't innovate everything so when you take a community based approach there are several people several thought processes that can come together if you are like minded i think we will be able to innovate more so that's the idea and of course we are also taking several other initiatives through tether helping new age startups right from the grassroots level help them set up a company we work with a company called india filings which takes care of company registration to account opening to everything so we help such startups and we'll also bring in a bunch of investors seed investors angel investors into the community we can run something like pitch fest or like show road shows for uh, these startups to raise money or get hmm. access to investors hmm. like a discord channel or is it a or exactly that's exactly what i'm trying to uh, it's very new very early stage i would say uh, the the entire effort is just 3 4 months uh, we are building that very discord type of channel to keep the messaging around and all that so what it will one day turn out into will be as i mentioned it will be more about fintech entrepreneurship starting up taking an idea to market or validating an idea and all that and less about m2p incubator or, or yc something right. like that like very similar okay okay like you're basically building a yc for fintech basically yeah but yc again there is eligibility criteria and all that we here we are trying to go in an all inclusive kind of manner see uh, if you ask us what is our vision is that uh, we have to make financial services universally accessible when i say universal it's not just the world one day there will be tra- like elon musk says in by 2040 there will be a human colony in mars and there will be payments happening there we want to empower that as well and there are people building metaverse here and there weddings are happening in metaverse so the gifting can happen through the fintech channel so we are trying to make the financial inclusion is a serious problem we should definitely attend that we should make every human on earth or anywhere else have access to financial services in a digitized manner so that's the overarching vision right this community approach is one such stream to make sure that accelerates and gets the power of networking there we as m2p alone can't solve that problem we think a community effort will definitely uh, help us reach there faster if you like the founder thesis podcast then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing technology career advice books and drama visit the podium.in that is t h e p o d i u m .in for a complete list of all our shows